Hi guys. Last time I showed you my simple VGA circuit running at 640x480 with 8 colours, but I was in a hurry at the time so I didn't go into the details of how I upgraded it to get there. And I've been a bit busy since then so sorry for the delay, but here are the details of the upgrade. To start with, here's the original 640x480 monochrome output circuit. I'm going to cut this out of the main circuit diagram now as it's getting too crowded and we only need to focus on this bit for now. What we have here is a shift register that's getting loaded once every 4 pixels with 4 bits of data and then shifted along once per pixel so each of the 4 bits appears on its output in turn uh, giving us 1 bit per pixel and that's why we got a monochrome image out of that. Using a shift register like this is a very standard technique and there are two main reasons it helps here. One is that it allows us to pack the data for more than one pixel within each byte of video memory, which requires less memory overall in exchange for lowering the colour depth. The other reason is that the RAM itself isn't fast enough to fetch fresh data for every pixel of the display at 25 MHz, so video RAM bandwidth is an important consideration. And the RAM has a nominal 55 nanosecond access time, but the VGA pixel period is around 40 nanoseconds, which is shorter than the 55 nanoseconds. So right now I'm reading from RAM once every 4 pixels, which is just under 160 nanoseconds. And in fact, given that I need to reserve some time between reads in case we want to write to the RAM, this is still actually overclocking the RAM by quite a large margin. As I've said before, it seems to work okay for now, but I will need to address this at some point. This is also 8-bit RAM, so we get 8 bits of data for every 4 pixels on screen. Because I'm embedding the sync and reset signals in the same data stream, four of those bits are actually lost, so we only have four bits of data remaining for the four pixels on the screen, which gives us one bit per pixel again, which is just enough for a monochrome image. For a colour image, we need more bits per pixel, and to do that we're going to need to increase the RAM bandwidth somehow. One option is to use faster RAM and read from it more often. However, I can't get hold of faster through-hole RAM in the sizes I need to make that practical. So instead, I'm going to increase the data word width from 8 bits to 16 bits by adding a second RAM IC in parallel. It's going to have all its address pins connected in exactly the same way as the first one, but its data pins are going to be independent, so effectively they'll function together like a single 16-bit RAM module. Four of the bits will still be used for the control signals, and four will still provide the red channel data for the four pixels in the sequence, but we now also have space for four bits of green channel data, and 4 bits of blue channel data, which gives us 3 colour bits per pixel overall. So we're going to add one more shift register for each additional output bit. In effect, the original shift register is going to handle the red channel, and the two new ones are going to handle the green and blue channels. They're going to shift and load at the same time, uh, but they'll be loading from different RAM data bits, and their outputs will go to different pins on the VGA connector. There's one final detail needed to make this work. I've described this RAM chip combination as a single 16-bit RAM unit, but I still need to be able to write to it from the CPU's 8-bit bus. I'm going to have to arrange for the two halves of the RAM to be selected individually, one at a time, during the CPU write operation, and the CPU will have to perform two separate write operations to write a whole 16-bit word of data. In practice, I did this in a really hacky way that I don't want to explain really, uh, but you can see it on screen if you're interested. To make that work as well, we need a second data bus transceiver. So when the CPU is writing to video memory, we want to offer its 8 bits of data to both halves of the video data bus, uh, but we don't in general want those two halves of the video data bus to be connected to each other. So the top half has to be connected through another one-way transceiver, just like the bottom half is. So let's recap. Here are the changes we need to make to the old circuit. We need to add a second 512k RAM chip with its address and control signals, mostly connected exactly like the existing one is. We need to add two more shift registers, wiring their input to the new RAM chip and their output to the VGA connector. And again using the same control signals as the old shift register was. And we need to add a new bus transceiver to replicate the CPU's data bus to the new high half of the video data bus during write operations. So that's all the theory out of the way, let's look at the breadboard and figure out how we're going to fit this all in. So here's the existing monochrome 640x480 circuit. There's not much space here so we're going to have to rearrange things a bit to make room. 
Firstly, we have this old multiplexer in here that we're not doing anything with anymore. So I'm going to get rid of that. And we also have the VGA cable connection over here, which I'm going to move off the main breadboard, including the resistors. Then I can move the shift register from over here into the space where the multiplexer was next to the RAM it reads from. And I can move the 4-bit transceiver into the space where the VGA connector was alongside the other transceivers, which will be much more symmetric as well. There's also this inverter and NAND IC over here, which are being underutilized. So I can collapse them into just a single NAND IC by using two of its gates as inverters and getting rid of the inverter chip. So I'll do that too, and then we can get into adding the extra RAM. Here we are then, part way through uh, what I described earlier. Uh, there's a much bigger gap here now. I removed the inverter and moved the NAND across a bit, and I moved the shift register over to where the multiplexer was. I still need to move the 4-bit transceiver in place of the VGA connector over here, so I'll go ahead and do that next. Now you can see most of the ICs in their new places. Here's the 4-bit transceiver, and the VGA connector is relegated to this daughter board. The new RAM is over here, the same kind of IC as the old one was, and there are two additional shift registers, just like the old one over there. And you can see I've connected up some of the control signals on the new shift registers, but not the data lines yet. This gap is big enough for the second data bus transceiver to go in later on, but first I'm going to connect the new RAM up. Okay, so now we have the data lines connected between the shift registers and the RAM, and on the RAM, the chip select is connected low, Output enable and write enable are connected to the old RAM, so they have the same control signals. And we have some of the same address lines connected as well. Still more of them to go though. And we're pretty much there now. Lots more wires, all the address lines are hooked up, and I have the outputs from the green and blue shift registers connected across to the VGA connector's resistor network. So we can power this on now and we get this random blue and green pattern, which is to be expected because the new RAM is not being initialized yet, so it's just containing random data. And if I let the program run, then we get the same old pattern displayed on the red channel only, as you'd expect, because the old RAM is, of course, still being initialized correctly, and the sync signals and so on also come from that old RAM. Uh, so that's all good. The next step is to actually initialize the new RAM with some data, and that's going to require hooking up the uh, data bus properly with that second transceiver. So here's the circuit with the new data bus transceiver in place, which will allow us to write into this new RAM block from the CPU. Remember, that was important because we needed to replicate the CPU's 8-bit data bus across both halves of the wider 16-bit video data bus. So when I get this powered on, you can see that the test pattern is, is now appearing in magenta instead of red, which is great. Uh, the reason for this is that due to a quirk in the way I control access to the two RAM banks, the unmodified program code is actually initializing the new RAM with exactly the same data as the old RAM. It's just writing to both banks simultaneously. The top four bits of the old RAM contain sync and control signals, uh, and that's what's in the green channel here. Um, but because they're all constant during the visible portion of the image, we don't see a green signal at all. And the bottom four bits of the old RAM, of course, contain the red channel data, which is also being replicated into the bottom four bits of the new RAM where the blue channel lives. So I updated the software to initialize the new RAM differently to the old RAM. So the signal should show red values increasing from left to right, blue values downwards, and green values increasing downwards as well, but at a slower rate, only once every 16 lines. I still wasn't seeing much green though here. Um, it was there, but really dim. Um, and it took me a while to figure out why. So to try to narrow it down, I disconnected the green output from its shift register and connected it alongside the blue one instead. And as you can see, that made the blue go cyan uh, on screen, which means that at least the monitor and VGA connector are working fine. I also tried swapping the signals over completely, and then it was the blue signal that was weak rather than the green one. So I tried swapping the actual shift register ICs, and that didn't help at all. Uh, so it was pretty confusing overall. It took me a while to figure this out, but the problem was due to the way I was initializing the second RAM chip. Due to a kind of code bug, I was still initializing the green channel with sync signal data. 
but then I was overwriting its data during the visible area with the image data that I wanted to display. But off screen, the green channel was not going to black. Uh, it still contained the vestigial sync data, uh, the sort of echo of the data from the other RAM IC. Um, and this upset the monitor's level detection circuitry, as it relies on seeing a nice steady black signal during the blanking period uh, to establish what the black level is, and then it interprets the voltages during the scan line relative to that to work out how bright it should be. So because I wasn't giving a consistent black level during the blanking period, uh, the data that I was supplying it during the actual scan line uh, was not being interpreted correctly. The solution was simply to ensure that the new RAM was properly wiped to zeros, uh, including in the blanking intervals, before putting any other data into it. Um, it just took me a long time to actually figure out that that was the cause. So I guess if you ever have any problems with uh, lack of contrast in your VGA circuits, uh, that's something to consider. Make sure that you are correctly uh, zeroing out the, uh, the red, green and blue channel signals during the blanking intervals. So here's the test pattern result with that fixed. Red is increasing to the right, green downwards, and blue downwards once every 16 lines. I guess I swap those channels over. Um, remember that these are 4-bit values, defining the state of 4 pixels in a horizontal row. So the pattern looks kind of weird, but it makes sense when you're used to it, and this is correct. So with that all working, I went away and kind of merged some of my SD card project into this one, so that I could read the large amount of data required to display the Gouldian Finch image at 640x480 with 3 bits per pixel. There's no way this would fit in ROM. It's something like uh, 300k or something like that. So you can see that it loads the blue and green channels first and then fills in the red channel afterwards. All it's doing is enabling one of the RAM ICs and then loading its contents from the file on the SD card. And then it's selecting the other one and loading into that. The data file was generated especially for this layout by a Python script using the Python image library or whatever it is. Um, and it was arranged to fill from the bottom up because that's also easier to loop that way around on the 6502, so it's pretty tailored for this purpose. And the image itself was colour reduced to uh, 3 bits per pixel uh, using GIMP. Going back a bit, you'll notice there's a lot of sync while the green and blue data channels are being written, which I've since determined is probably due to the 4-bit bus transceiver being an HC part rather than an AHC part like the other transceivers. Um, and I think that was just too slow at the moment for uh, dealing with the transition between CPU writes and video reads. I've done an interesting investigation into the timing I'm achieving here, and as I said before, it turns out I'm running everything way too fast, uh, beyond the specified limits, I'm about two times out of spec in general. So I might make a video showing all the timings of the various chips involved and how I put that into a spreadsheet to work out uh, how bad it is and what I can do about it. So last time, Fish suggested adding another channel to get back to the full 16 colour EGA palette, which would be nice. It would need more RAM again. Uh, and in order to do that, what I'd probably do is move the sync uh, control data uh, out of the 512k RAM chips in, back into a smaller RAM chip, or even ROM. Um, and then I could use both of these large RAM chips for uh, high resolution image data, because the sync data doesn't need this resolution. I have other plans too, as I mentioned before, especially some hardware assists for the 6502 to make it more efficient at writing individual pixels and things like that. And maybe also more involved hardware acceleration like blitting operations, which would be fun stuff indeed. So I really hope I get time to do more of this soon. As always, I hope that was interesting. Let me know what you think in the comments, or if there are any particular questions about anything, do let me know. I do try to read and reply to as much as I can, um, and I will see you next time.